Kevin and any questions or comments we have from either our virtual or physical guests uh, will be will be passed on to the minister and his team. Uh, I'll just check with the AV team. Have we got Errol and Roger online? Dominic, greetings. Hello, Hi, Roger. You? Errol. Good to see you, mate. Thank you for joining us. I'm going to also invite a third guest to come and join me on stage. It's Dave Manning, who we met earlier from Dewey Renewable. Thank you, Dave. You can have a, a seat and a, and a microphone. Just be, before we proceed with the panel session, I believe we've got a question here from um, somebody in the audience. I'm just going to... Thanks. Uh, Errol, are you there? It's Mark from Payter. Mark, yes, I'm here. Oh, nice to hear from you, Errol, and uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, I was just um, interested in um, uh, your points about the Northern Cape and over the next five years, the um, potential you see being unlocked in that uh, region. Is it uh, sort of the ground f greenfields exploration potential that you're seeing or uh, more um, uh, unloved uh, assets like Prishka that uh, uh, you seem to be um, on the right path in uh, rejuvenating? I, I see both. Um, there are some things that people have been working on and maybe looking through our lenses and our eyes, having five years of experience there, we see it slightly better. Um, so we see opportunities there, but the greenfield exploration opportunity is just amazing. You know, that some of the most prolific copper um, producing areas in this whole belt have never had an airborne EM flown over there. You know, there's never been big uh, moving loop EM, ground EMs done. That is standard practice when you're for copper anywhere in the world. And the technology has just never been used. So uh, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. There's a very easy step-up opportunities at the moment. And, um, yeah, that's why I know it's going to go that quickly. Thanks. And uh, yeah, we've seen a fair bit of um, exploration success in um, Australia at the moment, particularly Western Australia. Um, you know, is it going to take a, a one-hit sort of uh, wonder in South Africa to uh, uh, see more ASX-listed companies over there? Look, I think there's been a growing number of ASX-listed companies coming over to South Africa. I think there's now seven or eight of us um, that are actively exploring in South Africa. But yes... Uh, I think the eyes are opening very quickly, and it's not just the juniors and it's not just the Aussies. You know, I think some of the South Africans are doing a little bit of intro introspective looking at the moment and realizing they've missed an opportunity. So that's why you, you even see Anglo American making statements about going back into mass metal exploration because maybe we just reminded them of what the opportunity was. Remember, those geologists that worked for those major mining houses weren't a bunch of fools, they were very smart guys there. But it was 30, 40 years ago. So they didn't have the technology and they probably didn't have the management support. And things have changed. We do have more certainty. It's not perfect. But it was when I went to South Africa five years ago. Thanks, Errol. Hello? Yep. We just lost okay. you for a second, Errol, but we've got you back. Thank you very much for the question, Mark. Do we have any other questions from the audience or comments before we dive into the panel discussion? Oh, yes, we have got one. Mark, do you want to? I'm Bianca Manzi from uh, Walkabout and Predictive Discovery. Uh, I'm with respect to uh, the reg regulatory reform that's happened in South Africa and with regards to the licensing, what in particular would make it attractive to Australians and other explorers now to take up licenses? What are the key things that, that you see? Roger, did you want to take that one? Look, I think the biggest single challenge was in the past we had Oh, sorry. No, no, Roger, go ahead, you Errol. Pick it up. No, no, Errol, you go, go ahead. ahead. Yeah. Look, in the past, we had mining charter requirements for exploration. 
mining charter requirements for exploration are just a complete disaster because having to do all these um, issues that the, the big operating mines have to do for an exploration company just doesn't work. And I think Dennis Montashi and the DMRE saw that two years ago when we renegotiated the mining charter. And having the mining charter removed from prospecting rights and exploration is the single biggest move. You know, you do not have to have a BE partner now to actually be exploring. You don't have all the local procurement obligations and that. Now what suddenly it becomes is some of these earlier talks that we were watching now on ESG. Unless you do it, you don't get a social license to operate and the community is not going to allow you to operate and the labor force are going to be disruptive. So now it's a, it's a level playing field. I've got no difference now exploring in South Africa to what I do in going to across the border into Botswana or into Namibia. Um, so it's a far better situation. Yes, there is still a lot of administrative burden at the moment, but we see the DMRE absolutely trying to engage with us and remove that out of the way. They've seen that there's a way to make this happen because exploration investment immediately moves the needle on the economy. It's immediate jobs that are created. It's immediate growth in GDP. Um, you know, if, if we get, a, a, at the moment, South Africa's exploration budget is 1.8 billion rand a year. It's not big, $180 million. It's in pittance. But it's very easy to double that. And the impact on jobs and the supply chain and even on the national fiscus, because through employees, taxes, um, VAT, and in South Africa we've got uh, um, VAT, not GST, that money channels back to the fiscus as well. So exploration is an immediate impact on the economy, and that's why we've got to drive economy the minister sees it, the DMR sees it, that we've been working in a task team to try to come up with a way to clean up some of these other hurdles, but it's becoming attractive to work in South Africa and quite manageable to work in South Africa. Thanks, Errol. Uh, Roger, did you want to add any comments to, to Errol's response to that question? I think he's covered it all. I, and I think, we, it's, uh, um, I think the point of departure here is that um, the... There's a recognition of the criticality, particularly on the exploration side, to develop a new uh, exploration strategy. South Africa is accounting for, Errol mentioned, 1.8 billion uh, rand, which is about $100 million uh, being spent in South Africa at the moment. And the minister is now looking at how we can try and treble that or even make that five times bigger. So um, quite a bit of detailed discussions on how to achieve it, uh, not only with the DMRE, but also with Treasury. Uh, on issues related to incentives for venture capital funding. Um, and so uh, this is, a, I mean, the, the door is open. What COVID-19 has done is acted as a, as a tremendous critical um, catalyst for these types of conversations taking place. So um, the government have indicated they're going to produce an exploration strategy within the next few months. So uh, let's see what unfolds out of that. Um, they need to make improvements, obviously, to the online licensing system, SAMRAT, the entire... Um, mining cadastral system, um, they have agreed that those are areas that are being looked at. So uh, there's a pathway which is, which, which is we're certainly on this pathway, and uh, so I'm certainly in agreement with Errol that we're making progress. Uh, but obviously that progress will be more concretized when we've got um, that strategy coming out and we start um, bringing it back into conversations. Let's say at ADU next year, uh, when we're talking, hopefully we've also concretized some of the uh, incentives uh, that we want to put in place from a venture capital funding perspective. Thanks, Roger. It's interesting you mentioned the ADU in 2021 because it strikes me that ADU down the years has uh, been able to chart the shifts and, and changes in policy and government attitudes in South Africa towards the mining sector. Uh, we've had some uh, rather colourful debates. Uh, you've been involved in a couple of them yourself, in fact. But uh, if we look at the state of play in the sector today, are you fundamentally more confident about the future of mi the, the mining investment climate in South Africa than you were when you started with the minerals at CEO of the Minerals Council in 2013? Yes, I mean, listen, we have made um, you know significant progress on a wide range of issues. I mean, for starters, uh, we're not dealing with a corrupt minister, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. When uh, Gwede Mantashe took over as minister in 2018, you immediately set about re-engaging the industry because I remember sitting on your platform, I think it was back in 2017, I made the comment that the industry had lost confidence uh, 
uh, in the erstwhile minister um, uh, and his leadership of the department, um, Minister Mantashi, he's a, he's, a, he's a tough negotiator, make no mistake, he's not a pushover. He's a, um, he comes to the table with, a, with his own different ideas, uh, etc. But the fact is that there has been more engagement that's taken place constructively in the last two years than we've seen actually in the last, probably the last 10, 10 years in the sector up until the last two years. Now, engagement is one thing. Um, when you've got a minister, he's the first minister in the democratic era that has actually worked in the sector. So that's quite an important part of, of you know, looking at how you can encourage investment in the sector. Uh, we sometimes call him the shop steward of the sector because he does obviously have to convince his internal cabinet colleagues of the key issues. But I think we've made some progress on creating a more predictable and stable environment. Yes, there are areas where we still disagree. There are some charter areas, particularly around continuing consequences where there are ongoing court processes underway, but that doesn't mean that we're not engaging on a wide range of other issues around exploration, how we get the logistical supply chain sorted out, how we unlock private participation in energy, particularly for self-generation, you know, how we have a greenfields exploration boom taking place in South Africa, et cetera. So the conversations have been constructive, they've been tough, um, um, but we are making progress. And I certainly think that we're in a different space to where we were. I do think though that one of the critical factors that we need to just get government to continue working on is obviously reducing red tape, moving towards smart tape systems of administering rights. They have committed to reducing uh, licensing times for both exploration and for mining by half. Uh, that's, an interesting that's an interesting contribution. But I think what's important about that is we also need to make sure that the systems are much easier to administer, that the government has the capacity to make sure that the implementation can take place on a seamless basis. Um, and that we're creating a frameworks that enable us to continually become more competitive. So we have moved up the rankings. I think when, you know, if we look at the ranking moves that we've had on the Fraser Institute survey on a policy perception index, we were sitting at one stage uh, at position number 81 for our policy scorecard. We are now sitting in position 54. So there has, has been a, a move of something like 25, 26 places. Uh, and we've said that we've continued to emphasize with the minister that we need to get ourselves back into the top quartile of investment destinations in terms of our attractiveness. And that's going to require policy stability, predictability, and obviously having a competitive framework in place. So in the mining space, we're making progress. In other parts uh, in South Africa, from a more broader economic policy perspective, we've got some big challenges there. But uh, again, there's been quite a lot of engagement with government to try and unlock the real potential the private sector brings to the table. Does uh, Minister Mantache's uh enthusiasm for the sector, does, does that translate into the wider government? Is uh, President Ramaphosa a supporter of the industry? Well, President Ramaphosa uh, was the former uh, uh, General Secretary and then President of the National Union of Mine Workers. So he, he's got a natural affinity with the industry. Um, and uh, from his own business connection perspective, he was obviously involved in a number of companies that were related back to the mining sector. So. Uh, no doubt that we've also engaged with the president. Uh, there are a couple of other uh, ministers uh, that we've been engaging with in the seven aside task team, uh, looking at the, at the whole country's economic revival plan. And uh, mining has certainly been getting its share of attention. Uh, and even in the um, revival strategy that was produced by government, uh, mining has mentioned uh, several times in terms of what we can do in unlocking the potential. It talks about regulatory reform. It talks about uh, shortening licensing times. It talks about getting the infrastructure issues sorted out to enable network industries to deliver better. Um, and it's not just the engagement that's happening with government. We've also started having a lot more engagement over the course of the last six months uh, with some of the big state-owned companies, uh, ESCOM in particular, um, and with Transnet. Uh, we've set up these quarterly uh, leadership forum discussions. We've got technical task teams dealing with specific commodities to see how we're going to unlock the potential of those commodities. And again, this is not something that we have been doing on a regular basis in the preceding uh, five years, uh, you know, up until now. So I think, again, the catalyst for change is really, you know, uh, we've got to get this economy back on track and we're not sitting on our hands. Uh, we, we, we're certainly pushing government on some of the issues that we need to get uh, answers on in electricity, in rail, etc. You mentioned electricity, Roger, and, and, and Errol, you mentioned energy as well during an energy security during your presentation. We have Dave Manning here from Dewey. Dave, you mentioned South Africa during your presentation as well. It, uh, looking at as a, an investor in, into South Africa, is the regulatory environment uh, consistent enough and, and stable enough for, for Dewey to, to, to prosper there? 
It's been challenging. Um, the last couple of years for us, uh, very difficult to obtain license, generation licences and, and transmission licences. I think the Minister made an announcement at Indaba uh, earlier this year, um, which was groundbreaking for us, uh, opening up the, the licensing and allowing us to, to generate uh, at above uh, one megawatt was, was big, and that made a big difference. We still haven't really seen the, the fruits of that yet. We're working on it, and certainly Errol and his team have done a fantastic job over the last couple of years. We've been working on this solution for, for Prescare, and it's, um, I think uh, Errol admitted it's, it's been a long road. Um, the uncertainty makes it very difficult for us. Uh, certainly for an off-grid mining renewable energy solution, you're looking at uh, a long-term forecast, and it's very hard to, to evaluate your options not knowing what the tariff's going to be. Um, not knowing what restrictions there are and not, not knowing what your, um, your energy security is. So it's been challenging for us. Um, but I think certainly in the last 12 months with the, uh, the recent announcement by Minister Mantashi and, and where the industry is heading, it's getting better. Um, we, we think that there's a, a really good opportunity there and if we can start to get a couple of these permits through and licence a few of these off-grid mining solutions, I think it'll go a long way to giving investors some security. Errol, how much of a, well, obviously, uh, energy security has been a huge impediment to, to greater investment in the, uh, in the resources sector there. How, how important is this leap in uh, the, the reliability of, of renewables and the regulatory environment around it to, to the future of mining in South Africa? Uh, look, at it, it is absolutely core to everything. We need in energy certainty and we need cost-effective energy certainty. So South Africa has lost most of its beneficiation because we just can't afford to run smelters anymore. Our, our smelters are shut down because the cost of grid energy that's produced predominantly from coal just isn't viable. Um, you know, we have uh, Mr. Marius de Reta, the head of ESCOM, the, the national um, generator and um, supplier of electricity, comes and briefs us at the Minerals Council every month, every second month. And... Even he recognises the value of renewables and the cost of renewables. You know, elsewhere in the world, and, and Marius gave us these figures, um, a 25-year PV plant in North America or in Spain is generating a 2.1 US cents a kilowatt hour. Um, and that's where we could be going. That's, that's getting cheaper than the hydroelectric power that you're seeing in Asia that uh, powers all the smelters. So having renewable energy makes a world of difference. Both it gives us the certainty, it takes us into the green era, which is critically important. We need to be going there as responsible miners into the future. But then, of course, South Africa is absolutely superbly placed in this whole hydrogen economy um, because we've got basically all the platinum, and platinum is key to the hydrogen economy. We've also got a lot of the rare earths and that kind of thing that are very important in all of this. South Africa is very well positioned from a macroeconomic perspective to drive this whole, um, the, the whole sustainability of being completely off-grid and going with either batteries, vanadium. Um, I know that Bushfield Minerals have been doing some great stuff on vanadium batteries, We've got lithium, um, and we've got this hydrogen. The solar and wind, it's, it's you know, I don't think, uh, and, and Juvie recognises, we've got this fantastic opportunity. We've got very high solar incidents during the daylight hours, and the wind blows all night. So what a perfect solution. Between solar and wind, we could be generating enormous amounts of renewable energy, and a little bit of time that ESCOM isn't there to back us up we believe that we could have battery power. And that brings you to the point that you can now start looking at beneficiation again. Suddenly on the back of the matchbox, we're doing numbers and we're saying, well, you know, at 40,000 ton per annum of copper production, a calcining and SXCW plant works. And with the renewable energy costs fed into that um, estimation, suddenly it becomes attractive. So we look around ourselves and you saw the figures that I was showing there earlier on. I, I see that we could have 70,000 tonnes of copper available. So now you're even starting to the next point where you could start looking at producing blister copper. And, um, you know, the, the development finance ag agencies are seeing this and they're seeing the value of this. So we're in discussions with a number of the development finance agencies and I know that they engaging with renewable energy generators like Dewey and others. So 
it's a, it's a very exciting time to be operating and playing specifically in that new era slash battery metal space. So the Northern Cape in South Africa is really going to become a major growth hub for the whole subcontinent and the whole region. To make one quick point, if I may, before you before you go around, just just to also to add to Errol's point, I mean, from the mining sector side, we've taken a very different approach uh, to what we had done historically about um, how we bring on new energy capacity in South Africa. So at the end of last year, early this year, uh, we took a much more direct sort of uh, break the door down approach to engagement with government on the need to get uh, and to be very practical on what we needed to do to get. Um, the minister and his team and others to um, start understanding the real practical challenges that we face. So um, mining companies at the moment have got about 2.3 gigawatts of potential um, energy projects. About 1.7 gigs of that is renewables. That's wind, solar, hybrid. hybrid. Um, we've got some of the companies that have got uh, green hydrogen projects in place where they're obviously going to translate it back into cleaner, safer vehicles, obviously platinum fuel cell powered um, 260 ton dump truck that's being run by Anglo American, you know, at the Mahalochwena Platinum project, you know, as an example, with obviously lithium ion uh, battery backup. And that could be quite an interesting game changer given the um, other announcements that have taken place in the last week between, you know, some of the big um, truck companies talking about uh, their move towards fuel and adopting fuel cell technology given its tremendous impact uh, on cleaner, safer vehicle. Um, a haulage, particularly in the big in the big trucks. So, just a point I want to make is that you know I think uh, in the last year, and I think uh, Dave um, in his comments said that it wasn't easy before that. It's still not easy. We still have a number of constraints. We're taking a number of different projects uh, through to a sort of uh, one-stop shop task team, um, you know, driven by one of the deputy director generals in the Department of Energy. And uh, with the minister, I've been engaging him, and you know he keeps on saying to me, he calls me uh, he calls me Frank, and I call him Candid. And at the mining in Dava this year, you know, he did say to me, stop lobbying. You've got what you need. We're going to give you self-generation. Uh, so we've been pushing the angle really strongly. And I think we should start seeing, last week, there was an announcement that uh, the, it's now recorded by NERSA, the National Energy Regulator, that any of these projects no longer require ministerial uh, approval or exemption from the Integrated Resource Plan 2019, which is what you had to get as one of the one of the licensing uh, issues going forward. So that's another bit of the jigsaw puzzle that's kind of like fitting together uh, properly. So again, we're not we're not sitting on our on our hands, you know, waiting for government to come to the party. You know, we're really pushing hard to get these uh, opportunities open because we think this is a critical component of enabling the sector to be competitive. Also, from a pricing perspective, price predictability on energy is going to be one of the game changers going forward. It's not just about the ESG requirements, it's not just about responsible sourcing, it's also going to be about price predictability given the challenges we've faced over the last decade. Thanks, Roger. David, did you have anything to add to that? No, I, I think they're perfect comments. Yeah. Are you seeing, uh, Errol mentioned um, downstream beneficiation and, and uh, opportunities for uh, new sources of energy from there. Is that an area that you, you Dewey has positioned itself in? Yeah, it certainly is, and there, there's several projects. Uh, you guys may be familiar with the Butcher Bird project here in Western Australia, where we're looking at a, a manganese project where um, the, the processing is, is utilising renewable energy at its peak. So, in other words, the electrolyzer are, are only, sorry, the electrolyzers are only running when there's sunshine. So, it, it's what we're calling variable mining now, and we're looking at uh, changing the way we mine and process to take advantage of the of that resource, that energy resource. So we're certainly seeing that, and that's something that's a, a very big part of our future. Thanks, Dave. Um, Roger, you mentioned eight um, areas of focus in your presentation that, that where, where improvements need to be made or, or areas that, that the Minerals Council is focusing on. In, in Western Australia, we, we quite often give ourselves a pat on the back for being such a great jurisdiction, and we hardly have any problems, that, impediments that we have to get over. But uh, it strikes me there might be a difference in reality on the ground in South Africa. Uh, things, when we see eight major problems, uh, does that fill Australian investors with fear? And should it fear, fear, fill them with fear? Or should they, is the reality on the ground somewhat different? My perspective is that it's really important to, you know, to um, for all the stakeholders involved in these conversations to recognize that there is a challenge in a particular area. I mean, obviously, we can bucket load those into slightly smaller buckets. So, in fact, we've got six different task teams that we've been working on with government uh, to address the eight different issues that we've specifically um, 
mentioned you know, earlier in the presentation. So, Dominic, I think uh, uh, for us, the critical issue is that we've identified these areas. We've got a specific... Um, we haven't gone into any of the conversations with the minister without a specific focus on what the solutions are. So, on the energy side, we went in there with some very clear ideas. It's not only about fixing ESCOM. ESCOM is part of the solution. But it's uh, it's kind of only part of the solution. It's it's about how we allow self gen to come on and how that will help change the world. You know, decentralized smart grid grids are going to be the name of the future, and they're going to be obviously, as Errol was saying a bit earlier, you know, much more greener technology based. But at the same time, you know, when we're dealing with areas around crime, you know, we've got uh, let, let me give one practical example. We've got uh, uh, our national rail service provider in the form of Transnet Rail Freight. They obviously take most of our bulk commodities. Uh, from put to port, and obviously they then exported those products are then exported around the world. The challenge that they've been having is that they've had um, challenges on, on cable theft on some of their lines. So they're only able to deliver 50% of the rolling stock that they should normally be delivering, for example, for, for the chrome industry. Now, um, our discussions with them is about how we synergize working with the uh, police, criminal justice cluster, et cetera, to, to make sure that we start getting you know, some significant improvements in the fight against crime and the way that it affects Transnet, because if, it, if it's affecting Transnet, it means that we're now putting a lot more product on road. So it's not only damaging the road network, but it's obviously a lot more expensive. So there's already been agreement uh, in the discussions in our technical task team, you know, working with Transnet, of what we need to do to, do to obviously up the game on getting much greater uh, capacity utilization on the rail fleet back into the, into the chrome and into the platinum uh, group metals mining side, which obviously produces a significant amount of chrome as a byproduct. So, no, I think, I think the right way to define it from our perspective is you, you can't solve a problem if you haven't agreed on the problem, um, and you can't manage what you can't measure. And so we've taken that sort of real practical approach. And everything that we're focusing on is to say, listen, how do we improve our competitiveness? How do we improve our competitiveness? How do we make South Africa on exploration or on mining licensing? How do we make ourselves much better so that we are competing in the neighborhood, not, not lagging in the neighborhood? Thanks, Roger. Errol, you're, you're a managing director of an ASX-listed company. Uh, you must hear often, uh, the same as we do at it, it it, that the perception that South Africa is just too complex for, for Australian companies to consider for investment. Is there a difference between perceptions and, and reality? Um, look, it's hard work. There's absolutely, there's no two ways about it. It is hard work. You have to continually engage. We've got a, a very big team that spend their days every day banging on the regulator's doors. And it's, unfortunately, it's not just one regulator. You're dealing with five or six different regulators, and then you've got to deal with municipal management. You've got to deal with provincial management. You've got to deal with national government. So it is a lot of engagement. But we found that if you go by the book and you work hard, you can get everything done. Uh, you know, there, there's very few places, even in Australia, that you could have applied for a prospecting right, got the prospecting right, carried out a drill program, completed a bankable feasibility study, got your mining right with all your approvals and your social license to operate in five years. You know, I, I challenge to do that in very many places. There are a few places that it's been done. And Western Australia is fantastic. But I can tell you that Victoria is a complete nightmare. I, I find it easier to operate in South Africa now than what I do in the state of Victoria in Australia. I, I can show you more administrative bungling in Victoria than what I can show you in South Africa at the moment. So this patch on well, my head over here isn't it South Africa because we've learned to work here in South Africa. We've built a mutual respect with our regulators. You know, a lot of people say to us, why aren't you just at war with them? Because I think Roger led the, the way there for the industry in South Africa. The Minerals Council now engages. We've stopped retreating to the trenches and shooting at each other. We actually now engage positively. And there are centres of excellence in all of these government departments. And instead of attacking them all the time, if you engage with the excellence, then the excellence rises to the top. And I'm sure you see that in the, in the electricity generation and dealing with ESCOM and dealing with the... The, um, energy regulator. Um, you know, there's, there's the more that a person engages and works constructively, the more you get to an outcome. And there's a lot of frustration on the past. But Roger's been doing it, as we've just heard now, for 28 years. Um, but I think we've had more progress in the last three years, the last two years. 
and what we lost the So I think it's gathering momentum and it's getting support because the government sees that hell, if you just do what's right, it actually works. And then all of a sudden you stop getting the resistance to everything. The more they see that if they do it right, it works, the more they support you to keep doing it right. So there's a mutual respect, and, and we do, as Roger says, we have a couple of good brawls with the minister, and with all the ministers for that matter. Um, but it's not an ugly brawl. It's actually a very successful debate and workshopping the problems and finding solutions. Thanks, Errol. Uh, I'll just, we've only got a few moments left, and I'll just point out to, to both Errol and Roger that... Uh, you know, rather precarious position of being two South Africans that are keeping a room full of Australians from their Friday evening beer. So <laughs> we don't want to keep anyone around for too long. Um, <laughs> where, uh, maybe for, for you, Roger, where is uh, most investment interest into the country coming from? Uh, Errol said the seven or eight Australian juniors there in, uh, in South Africa now. I, I, are you seeing uh, inbound interest from, from specific regions? Yeah, listen, I mean, obviously, we've had um, quite a bit of interest from uh, from other Eastern countries like China and others. Um, and there is an increase in China presence in South Africa's mining sector, uh, mostly buying up um, existing mining operations um, or equity stakes in those operations. And there's obviously some big linkages between South Africa and China on the banking side, you know, uh, Standard Bank, IBC uh, Bank, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, in, terms of, in terms of the interest, um, We've still got a, a, a number of large uh, multinational companies um, operating in the country. We've had a couple that have, have uh, reduced their exposure, but in, in particular areas where they uh, see some of the assets as tier two assets as opposed to tier one assets. Um, but there's still a very strong positive view that uh, get all the regulatory issues resolved and get us back on a much better exploration track. So whether you're dealing uh, in the diamond space, whether you're dealing in the base metal space um, and others, you know, there is interest coming in, uh, obviously still amongst a lot of the existing co companies that are operating in South Africa. You know, we, um, but we'd like to, I mean, let's face the reality. I mean, South Africa's got 12 companies listed on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange, which are venture capital listed. You know, there are 600 on the ASX and there are 1,200 on, on Toronto stock market. You know, so we've been trying to understand what's, you know, what the, what the secrets are of the success of both Australia and Canada. We're learning a bit. You know, venture capital is one big constraint that we have in South Africa. Uh, Errol's been one of the pathfinders to demonstrate that, you know, we can make it work. But we, we have been engaging very extensively with our government to try and get them to put in place some of the real tax breaks, whether it's flow through shares or related instruments that enable, you know, uh, the ability to raise venture capital funding on a much easier basis um, of being looked at. So that's, you know, I, I think it's sort of generalized response. I think once we've got the exploration strategy, or once government's produced that and hopefully it's got all the right bits in it, you know, we can go to PDEC uh, in, uh, in March next year and start really uh, selling South Africa's, uh, you know, the opportunities. Uh, and let's see, how that, let's see how far that takes us. But I'm sure Errol's got a couple of comments on that. Errol? <laughs> yeah, look, uh, there's a very active engagement. And we just had the junior mining, uh, the junior in Daba conference in South Africa, where the minister shared a, uh, a platform and uh, uh, there was a lot of discussion on what we're doing. Um, the the ta flow through tax scheme that we've presented to Treasury, the Minerals Council have led that, and we've done a lot of research with the four big uh, uh, tax consultancies and legal tax consultancies in the country. We really analyze it from the macroeconomic perspective. And then we took Treasury a win win scenario, demonstrated to them that if you get a, give a tax break to expiration, that money can immediately be invested in exploration and you'll actually get the money back through indirect taxation. So it's a net neutral situation and it drives economics and job creation. All of these things that we've spoken about on the regulatory side, the DMRE know they've got a problem. They've got constraints. As an industry, we're going to help them solve those constraints because a lot of it is technical and management. We'll work with them to find solutions and just get our whole permitting so that we can achieve this cutting permitting down to less than six months and get people in the get the drill rigs in the field and get the drill rigs turning. Then stuff will start happening. So yes, I do spend a lot of my time dealing with 
the minister and with the DMRE on this on behalf of the Minerals Council and the other junior explorers and, and miners. But I think it's paying off and the, 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 we'll see very shortly because the minister has given us an assurance in the next three months there will be an economic an exploration recovery plan. And I think that that's going to be great for South Africa. That's very positive to hear. Uh, we've got time for perhaps one question. Errol, you better be on your best behaviour because it's your chairman. <laughs> oh, God. You know, that's going to be nonsense. <laughs> uh, it's not for Errol, actually. Um, <laughs> Roger, Dennis Woodell here, mate. Um, Good day, Dennis. A shame you're not here. Uh, we'll look forward to next year. Um, Roger, there is, just getting back to some of the questions um, today from this session, but just generally what Dominic's talking about, there's a perception of um, how difficult South Africa is um, on a number of fronts. <clears throat> you know, we've, we've done a lot of hard work over the last five years, but there's absolutely no doubt there's been tremendous advancement made in the last 12 to 18 months. There's still this view about, you know, whether it's contractors or other mining companies or investors behind us and other potential mining companies coming into South Africa, the BEE issue is, is always front and centre. Um, and Errol did touch on uh, the changes to the, to the mining charter, which are really important from an exploration perspective, where you don't have the same requirements during that exploration stage right through to, to development of a mine. Um, <clears throat> but just... And you made a comment a little earlier, Roger, about, you know, and coming back to Dominic's question about some of the, the challenges in South Africa, sure, they're there, but there's a big shift and a positive shift in my view. Um, but if you could perhaps just comment on uh, and to clarify the difference between parties that are looking to coming into South Africa now as an explorer or a new developer like us with the Prisca mine, a lot of the legacy issues that you're dealing with in the Minerals Council and, and some of the larger mining companies don't affect us. A lot of people, it's, it gets muddied waters because, you know, you just get a general comment about there's a, there's a shit fight on, you know, with you know, some of the bigger mining houses, you know. So if you're able to just clarify that for newcomers, a lot, there is a lot more clarity in the, in the mining charter and that, you, you know, some of the, the, the hurdles that were in place previously have been removed and, the, and it is a lot easier to get to get access and to achieve your BEE requirements. So Dennis, no thanks, man. And, and uh, sorry we're not down there uh, joining you from us called beer after this. Uh, and again, I don't want to stand in between uh, a bunch of Aussies uh, in the audience and, and their beers. So I'm going to be too, very much to the point. Um, yeah, Dennis, listen, I think, it's, I think it's a really spot on question. And I mean, the point is that uh, as far back as 2001, when we were negotiating the first mining charter, we thought that we actually had agreement from government that they wouldn't apply any ownership requirements, be ownership requirements to exploration. Um, uh, but they went ahead and did it anyway. Um, so the 2018 charter, which was revised after some discussions with Minister Mantashi, obviously ex includes an exclusion of BE ownership requirements uh, for prospecting, uh, which is a really important issue because venture capital funded um, entities often don't have the capacity to carry a BE player you know, in, in, uh, in driving their particular agenda. They've got a cash flow. Um, they don't have a, a regular cash flow. They've got a one-source capital mind. You've got to go and find something. And then, so we've, we've kind of like encouraged the idea that, you know, once you find something and you start getting into uh, project development, you know, that's where your BE requirements can kick in. Um, and, you know, you know, obviously it's an a very important part of the inclusive development of South Africa to, uh, through this mining charter process. So, once you've got a BE player in place, you also want to have certainty that that BE player, or at least the credits that you've got in the BE deal, will be recognised if that BE player then sells up because they see an economic opportunity maybe in the tourism sector instead of in mining, that you don't end up being people, you know, uh, having to bring in another player and offer shares at a discount, which may end up complicating things. So that's still an area um, that's been dealt with uh, through um, a court process that we're involved in. It was actually a jointly agreed court process between ourselves and government because we couldn't find agreement on this particular issue. Uh, and, you know, it's not, I'm very much of the view that people must, um, on these issues around taking government to court, you know, must really understand that uh, South Africa is a constitutional democracy. And uh, if you disagree on something, sometimes the courts have a very good, uh, you know, a role to play in resolving a dispute that you can't get agreement on between yourselves. Um, so I think we've, we've made definitely on the exploration side quite a bit of progress on um, making sure that the rules are clear. Uh, we're going to try and escalate that and, 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 and get it a lot clearer in terms of the mining cadastral system and a few other things 
um, that need to take place. You know, we, um, Errol and myself, have been engaging government on the concept of having a, you know, a five-five-three process instead of just a five-three process, because it does take you 11, 12 years to really take to fruition a real exploration project, not not eight years in terms of the way that the current system is operating. But when it gets into mine development, you know, that's obviously an important part. But recognizing the credits when you take them forward are, are obviously also important. So those are some of the things that are underway at the moment. So we have a, a much gr greater degree of certainty, but still remaining elements that we need to resolve. But for me, the proof of the pudding is going to be in the eating as we take these concepts and ideas forward. Um, there are a number of companies, a number of B companies, that also are very heavily invested in the space. I think we've made tremendous progress as a sector in becoming much more representative um, in terms of our workforce, in terms of our procurement activities, in terms of our ownership patterns, and uh, having a massive uh, pool of new projects on the exploration side, um, feeding a new pipeline of new projects in South Africa, I think is going to be a game changer for the sector. But again, the proof of the pudding is when that investment actually happens. You know, we can talk about this now. You know, Errol is a living proof of, of Orion and what they're doing. You know, we want to see 10 times as much of, of, of that, you know, actually happening in South Africa in the next couple of years if possible. Great, Roger, and I think a fantastically positive uh, note to end on. Thank you, Errol. Thank you, Roger, in, in South Africa. And thank you, Dave, here in Perth, for joining thank us. You thank you for your question, Dennis. Hey, I'll just ask you to join me in, in thank, thanking our panellists today. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, I'll pass it over now to ch our chairman, Bill Repard, to give his closing remarks. Well, thanks, Tom. And... Um, Thanks, uh, Roger, Errol, and Dave for your contribution to the panel. Uh, it was a very good panel. And perhaps, uh, Errol or Roger, if you can maybe pass on our best wishes to uh, Gwede, uh, who, who would, I'm sure would like to have been with us today, but uh, we'd love to see him here in Perth next year. So a message to uh, the Honourable Ministers who are looking in on today's meeting or the Director Generals and your your teams, your departments, thanks for being part of us, uh, of ADU this year. Um, what we wanted to do with this conference was to reinforce a message from Australian listed companies that uh, the ongoing and strong commitment through these challenging times for, uh, about investing in Africa. And uh, that's, a, that, that's a message I think has come through the last three days. And I think uh, to ministers and your, your people, um, we're with you, and uh, we look forward to being with you next year. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned at the start of the um, meeting uh, three days ago, um, Australia and Western Australia have been incredibly fortunate, and uh, with health and, and uh, restrictions not upon us, we've been able to, um, I guess, hold a meeting like this, and we're delighted to have done that, uh, both uh, over the three days, both uh, physically and, and, and virtually, and... Uh, that's as a, uh, a, a something we're terribly pleased to have been able to do, and uh, I, I'd particularly like to thank our sponsors, uh, our supporters, our exhibitors, uh, for their support during quite an interesting time. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the uh, government representatives through uh, ambassadors, uh, African ambassadors, high commissioners in Canberra and of course DFAT and the team across uh, Africa who have uh, participated in a very positive way with what we're about. Um, likewise, I'd like to thank our technical team for pulling off, which I, I, I think has a, been a, 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 a massive job and uh, they've done a brilliant, brilliant job. So thank you, Dave and your team. As we know, we heard earlier today or yesterday, we heard that uh, sadly uh, the mining in Darba won't be happening in the physical next year. But we look forward to working with the team to uh, do what we can to do to bring part of the Aussie connection into wherever that middle ground happens to be. And uh, from our point, point of view, we, we optimistically say, and have booked in and locked in, that uh, we as, at Africa down and will meet here again in the physical between the 1st and 3rd of September 2021. So thanks for coming, and uh, please come and join us for a, uh, the trip.